My Vanguard portfolio is made up of just one fund, which might surprise many of you. Surely I'm missing out, right? How could an optimal strategy be, well, so simple. After all, if you benchmark my portfolio versus the three queens of Vanguard portfolio updates in the UK, then I'm massively out of sync as they hold a lot more than I do. Helen from Her Penny Potential holds four, including Life Strategy, VWRL, and the S&P 500. Marta from All The Honeys holds six, two in a SIP and four in a Stocks and Shares ISA. And lastly, D from Finance D, who holds six in total, including VWRL, the FTSE 250, and the All World High Dividend, as well as a few others. So before I share how my own Vanguard portfolios performed over the last month, I wanted to share why I think my one fund portfolio is truly overpowered, and equally, what I think is one of the biggest mistakes people make when creating their portfolio on Vanguard. So let's get into it. Why is my single fund portfolio overpowered, and how is it gonna help me amass more wealth than maybe somebody who's gonna get a better return from the markets? Well, let me explain. The concept is straightforward, and it's that we all have a limited amount of time and energy to give. Let me use my life as an example. I have a demanding job, a side business, a side hustle in Romla, this YouTube channel, a family, a gym that I don't go to enough, and then of course, I am a full-time dog dad as well. Any additional time or energy I might give in stressing over either fund allocations, researching the next big thing, or maybe looking into what job fees are undervalued versus the others is gonna take time or energy away from the rest of my life. I haven't really got any more time or energy to give so if I was gonna put it into one of these things, then I'd have to drop something alongside it. And I imagine you're exactly the same. And for this reason, I believe I'm gonna outperform others who might get a slightly higher return from the market because I choose to invest my time differently to them. I'm focusing more on making more income rather than trying to outperform the market. To illustrate this point, I came up with the following thought experiment. If you could spend two hours a week researching stocks or maybe other funds in order to get an additional 1% outperformance each year versus a global benchmark, how much money would you need to invest to make up the difference if you chose not to do this research? And just to be clear, managing to get a consistent alpha of 1.0 or in normal terms, an additional 1% of outperformance versus the rest of the world is virtually impossible especially over the long term. But let's imagine this is possible just for this example. You would have option A being that you could do those two hours of research every week and you would invest £100 per month for the next 30 years and you'd manage to get a 10% return for this. After 30 years, you'd have over £222,000. Congratulations. But let's say in option B, you go without the two hours of research to get that additional 1% and instead you decide to use that time to make a little more money on the side to invest. So instead of getting 10% per year, Year, you're only going to get 9% growth per year. So the question is, how much more money would you need to invest above £100 to close this 1% difference? Well, based on the numbers, you'd need to invest an additional £23.03 pence per month. Based on the outcome of this thought experiment, it'll be personal to you what would be the better strategy. But based on £100 per month, putting in eight hours a month to get an outperformance of 1% is equal to finding a way of earning £2.87 an hour for eight hours a month. I would hazard a guess that the vast majority of you will probably be able to make at least £23.03 in around two to three hours of your time instead of eight. You can probably see where I'm going with this. A lot of people really sweat the small stuff when it comes to investing and put an godly amount of energy into finding the perfect stock or the perfect portfolio. And in the rare occasion where they outperform the market in the long term, where, let me remind you, the odds are significantly stacked against you, they could have got the same result or probably better if they put the same amount of energy into making more money. Just some food for thought. And this segues perfectly into the biggest mistake I see when people create their portfolios on Vanguard. And this is that people hold multiple funds without knowing why, leading to complexity for no real purpose. As an example, in the comments section on a lot of my Vanguard portfolio updates, I often get asked a question that sounds something like this. Nick, I invest in both Life Strategy 100 and VUSA. What do you think? If you've ever read through one of the threads of the responses I give, you'll notice that I never give a judgment of if it's good, bad, ugly, or indifferent. I normally respond with just one question. Why do you hold these funds in particular? If we use the example of the portfolio which is split between Life Strategy 100 and VUSA, why would this individual own both of these funds? What is their thought process? Life Strategy 100 is a fund of funds 
which acts as a broad global index, which has a little quirk of having a heavy weighting to the UK. And funnily enough, it actually contains VUSA at a weighting of 15.5%. And then looking at VUSA, it's simply the S&P 500, which is of course the biggest 500 companies in the United States. Depending on the weightings of these two funds, it's likely that the Life Strategy 100 VUSA combination is actually a very funky mix, which resembles a FTSE All World or the Global All Cap as the lack of US weighting in Life Strategy 100 is actually boosted by VUSA, but it's likely still to have a higher exposure than normal to the UK as compared to real life. If this person wanted a fund which is perfectly balanced, then you'd purely just buy the FTSE All World or the Global All Cap. If you wanted a global portfolio with a bias towards the US, then you'd buy one of these two funds as mentioned, and then you'd have a secondary allocation to VUSA. But the reason why a portfolio would look like this is because the individual has a higher conviction that the US will outperform in the long term, thus wanting more exposure to it. But this is where I normally see the mistakes happening. When I do ask about their intentions for their portfolio, so what belief is their portfolio meant to be representing? I'm normally met with silence and in rare occasions I get a response that's either I'm not sure or I haven't really thought about it like that. Simply put, they're just doing what they think is best while they cross their fingers. But please don't take this as me slating noobs. These individuals, confused as they may be, are still running rings around anybody who hasn't even started investing yet. But a common mistake that they've fallen into is in thinking that complexity is needed to optimise their returns when this isn't true. The only thing your Vanguard fund needs to do is to represent your own investing beliefs and your risk tolerance. If one fund doesn't do this, then feel free to add another, but you should have a clear reason for doing so. Examples of why you might want to have more than one fund include the following. Having a higher exposure to bonds to reduce your portfolio's volatility. This is traditionally seen more often with individuals who are closer to retirement or are looking to cash out of their position sooner rather than later. Or as another example, an individual might have a high conviction or be very bullish that a certain geography is going to do very well in the future. Let's say that the conviction is that the UK is undervalued and thus will do very well in the long term. Due to this, they might put a portion of their investments into the FTSE 250 outside of a broad global ETF to increase their exposure to the UK. The real danger of not knowing why you have an additional fund is that your portfolio might not perform as you would like it to. If you're unknowingly under or overexposed to a certain geography or certain sectors, then you might start to panic when you're not seeing it acting like the broader markets. My only piece of advice is to make sure that your portfolio aligns with your beliefs as it will help calm your nerves when we inevitably have some market volatility in the future. Right. Time for the good stuff. Anyone new to this video series, and I mean, come on, I've been doing this for a year now, where have you been? To give you some credit, at least you're here now. So what do you need to know? As mentioned, I only invest in one fund, which is the FTSE All World U6 ETF, known as VWRL. I've been investing since the start of 2018, so I've just started my fifth year of investing. And finally, I lump sum invest. As soon as I get any spare cash, I throw it into VWRL. In terms of last month, I was holding 780 shares of VWRL, which was priced at £90 following a sell-off caused by the new COVID variant. This gave my portfolio a total value of £70,200, meaning that I'd finally broken the £70,000 mark for the very first time. But across December, it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride, with it shooting up, then down, and then resting around £2 above the £90 mark, which is still £1 off its all-time highs. This coupled with this month's direct debit, my portfolio is now worth £72,500, meaning that it's £23,000 higher than it was just 12 months ago. Before you think I've just jammed £23,000 into my account over last year, then let me show you the following. In December last year, my portfolio was worth £49,599 with profits of £8,025. As of right now, my market gains are now £18,500, meaning the £23,000 gain, over half of it is from market gains alone not direct debits from myself. But to temper myself, the last year has been anything but ordinary. But as it stands right now, I have been rewarded for being invested into the markets, but it could have easily gone the other way. No one can take credit for the returns they get, but if you're willing to take the risk, then you should get rewarded in the long term. I have now stayed consistent buying for four years. I continued to buy when the market was selling off at the end of 2018. And then of course, I continued to buy during the COVID crash in early 2020. But just as importantly as this, 
I've continued to buy when the market has been at all time highs. If you have a look at this graph, if I had refused to buy any all time highs, I probably wouldn't have bought anything since November 2020, which is over a year ago. And in that time, I'd have missed market gains of up to over 30%. Personally, I'm expecting a return of 7% over the next year, which is based on nothing more than long term trends. But I'm equally aware that the market could go significantly down or it could go up another 25%, nobody knows. But what is my full investing strategy for 2022? Well, if you want to know how I'm planning on turning my total investment portfolio of £80,000 and turning it into £110,000, then feel free to click on this video on the screen right now. That's all for this video. See you in the next one.